Make sure you check out our online store where we work with our graphic designer to create stunning garment and product designs that feature a wide variety of aircraft types such as British fighters, World War II aircraft, American bombers, Russian fighters and much more. You can pick your favourite designs and personalise any items within our Redbubble store that range from clothing right the way through to stationery. All of our designs feature our logo so you can show your support for the channel while getting a quality product. You can head to our website aircrewinterview.tv and click store or go to redbubble.com forward slash people forward slash AC interview. Thank you and enjoy. Chris, when did you first become interested in aviation? Uh, from a very young age, so probably as early as I can really remember. Um, from five or six, I, I was probably fascinated by aircraft. And then as I got older, that interest developed. Uh, I joined the Air Cadets as soon as I could. So at 13, I, I joined the Air Cadets. My um, father was also involved in the Air Cadets as a squadron boss for the local squadron. So actually I was tagging along with him even before I could join properly. So yeah, really from, from since I can remember I've been involved in aviation, always had my sort of hopes on being a, a pilot in the Air Force. So yeah, very early. What year did you join the REF? Uh, 2002, December 2002, I joined the Air Force. And did you have a type you wanted to go on to? I was an 80s baby, so fast jet yeah, was what I wanted to do. And, you know, I was brought up on Top Gun, so yeah, I was very much wanted to be a fast jet pilot, although flying anything in the Air Force would be, would be great, but yeah. So what aircraft did you start training on? Uh, so I started on the Tutor once I joined the Air Force. Uh, I had flown previous types, um, like the Bulldog when I was an Air Cadet, but the Tutor was what I started my elementary flying training on. Um, I did about 60 hours on that. Uh, and then after that got rolled, I suppose, so went, did get fast jet, so went to Linton uh, and was taught on the Takane, so basic fast jet flying training. Did find that very much a challenge at the time, and uh, at the end of that course I was streamed off to go back to uh, multi-engine and I did a short course to transfer onto uh, multi-engine aircraft and I flew the King Air for that. So a little bit longer way around to getting to the multi-engine mm -hmm. in the end, um, but yeah, I did find the Takane very challenging, so I'm not sure I was really cut out for being a fast jet pilot. <laughs> so what was the King Air like to fly? King Air was good. I mean, uh, having come from the Takane and, you know, single seat, it was or single seat, it was all moulded around you being a single seat fast jet pilot. You know, the instructor was sat in the back. It was just a voice in your headset. To then go side by side, multi-engine, um, it was interesting. I remember one, one time I was uh, told that I was a little bit too punchy. Now in fast jet trading, that would have been a compliment. And yeah. I sort of said, oh, thank you very much. And they were like, no, actually in multi-engine, you need to calm down, you need to take more time. I think it was an engine failure or something like that. And I tried to shut the engine down really, really quickly. And they said, no, you know, multi-engine flying, you, you, know, you do need to shut the engine down, but you need to make sure you get the right one. You need to interact with your crew. And so there was quite a few learning points that I had to sort of take on from coming from, um, you know, a fast jet orientated training to, to multi-engine. So how long did your training take before you got posted to, I guess, like your frontline aircraft? Yeah, um, so I, it took me about four years in total. Um, and even now there are obviously holds in the training system, there always have been. So there were a few holds for me and a hold is you know, between one course and the next. Um, but actually it wasn't too bad. So I, you know, I finished, finished Linton, got told that I was going to be sent to multi-engine and actually it was a few months and then uh, and then I was on to uh, 45 squadron on the King Air and that was a shorter course anyway so I didn't do the full course on the King Air um, so yeah it's about four years in total. So Chris we're here to talk about the VC-10 how did you get posted to this aircraft? I didn't really know much about the, the multi-engine aircraft that the Air Force had I, I knew which ones we had but I didn't know in detail what they did their roles for example um, so at the time we were given an opportunity to sort of list our preferences so I, I, I think I had Herc as my first choice because I still wanted to do that hands-on flying and I sort of had a perception that the Herc mm -hmm. offered that. Um, I was tempted by the Nimrod but I didn't <laughs> want to go up to Scotland so uh, so and the VC-10 I think was my third choice and it turned out that was the, I had it the highest out of the people that were being wow. um, roll disposed at that at that uh, time so I got the VC-10 um, and yeah I didn't I didn't know that much about it I knew it did refueling and a bit of air transport but that was it so was really surprised when I finally ended up on the squadron the variety of uh, roles and, and types of flying that I got to do on the on the VC-10. Yeah so let's talk about that so yeah what was the initial role of the VC-10 and what was the role when you joined? So I think historically the VC-10 was brought in as a, uh, a transport aircraft um, and it, uh, and then later on it went to refueling as well when it replaced the Victor. But initially I think it was just designed as a air transport and sort of freight move. Uh, when I was on the squadron, they just got rid of, uh, they just disbanded 10 squadrons. So there was only 101 squadron at the time. Yeah. Previous to that, I think, um, 
can't remember which way around it was, but one of the squadrons did air to air refueling, one of the squadrons did air transport. When I arrived, it was just 101 squadron and you did both. So from leaving the uh, ACU on passing and, and being a co-pilot, you were expected to be able to do air to air refueling and air transport. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that was, and that was the majority of what I did. I would say if I was to look back in my logbook, 80% of my hours is air to air refueling and probably 20% is, is air transport. All oh, right, I thought we'd split 50 50 actually. Yeah, I, I think because the TriStar was around at the same time. Of course, yeah. And of course, they could do air to air refueling as well, but you know, in terms of which was more capable in a weird way, that you know, the VC 10 was more orientated around refueling the tri and the TriStar was more orientated around air transport. So they would take the majority of air transport and we would take the majority of refueling. So, so what was the number of crews that it would have? So I think the squadron when I arrived had 16 aircraft. And I think we were maybe about 26 crews. It was a large squadron, it's particularly if you took, um, I think at one point the, one of the bosses was saying it was the largest squadron in the Air Force because of the uh, engineering cadre that we had as well for, you know, to maintain 16 VC-10s. You know, it's a large number of engineers and, and, and shift work there. Um, but yeah, so 16, 16 airframes. I can't remember the exact breakdown now, but uh, I think 11 of them were uh, VC-10 C1Ks. So that's the, uh, the, sorry, C1s, which was the transport aircraft. And then uh, you had uh, the K3s and the K4. So they were the um, airliners that were bought by the RAF and converted to tankers. Um, and you were expected to be able to, they were slightly different, all of them. So you were expected to be able to fly all three types. It wasn't drastic right. enough. There was a problem, but you, they were, there were differences between them. So let's talk about your ground training and could you just yeah go through that for us? Yeah, ground training. Uh, it was quite in depth actually. The VC-10 being an you know an old aircraft, you know initial designs from the 50s, you know first flight in 62. It was almost over-engineered in a way, and it was very much you could get to grips with it. So, and even as the the pilots as aircrew, you were expected to have a pretty good understanding of the system. So. It was more in depth than I'd ever done before in terms of I had to know, I had to be able to draw the technical layouts, you know, crudely, but the technical yeah. layouts of the electrical system, hydraulic system, fuel system. Wow. And uh, every year you used to have a ground cat. So even after you'd passed, every year you had a ground cat where you basically spend an afternoon one on one with an instructor being asked pop quiz questions. And some of those would be the technical in nature, some of them would be operational in nature. So the, the ground school was quite, quite in depth. And obviously a big step up from a, a turboprop twin engine <laughs> King Air to, you know, a four engine jet, you know, slick wing. So yeah, it was, yeah, quite intense from what I remember. Was there a simulator at the time? There was, yeah, there were two simulators. So one that was orientated more for the K variant, so the K3 and the K4, and one that was for the, uh, for the C1. Um, yeah, they, they were fine. I mean, they, you know, the graphics by modern day standards were pretty poor, but actually in a, in a you know, multi-engine trainer, do you need excellent graphics? Probably not. Um, they were motion, so that was the important thing. So uh, yeah, we did, we did a fair bit of time in the, in the simulator. Although versus a modern day course, we also got to do a lot of flying during our training on the aircraft, which nowadays just wouldn't happen because it's hugely expensive. And of course, you've got far more um, accurate simulators. But at the, at the time, we actually, I remember doing circuits in the VC-10 with four of us, four co-pilots on it, and just you know, taking it in turns for a good couple of hours yeah. doing, doing circuits, so yeah. Can you remember your first flight? Yeah, I can. Well, uh, oh, that's a tricky one, actually. I don't know if I can remember my very first flight, weirdly, actually. <laughs> but I can remember my first flight where I went and did air transport. So the line training, as they would call it. So I, I got to go. They were always looking for sectors. So they were you know, trying to tick up the, uh, the number of sectors that you needed to have under your belt before you were allowed to you know, be qualified as a co-pilot. So I ended up going to uh, the States and uh, going via sort of uh, Florida down to Belize and then back via um, Gander and back across. And it just, it was amazing, uh, you know, just to you know, finally be traveling the world. And also um, just the variety of locations that I'd gone to. I remember packing my bag that evening and sort of I had to have cold weather gear for Gander, but you know, <laughs> sunny shorts and flip flops for, for Belize. So yeah. and anywhere in between. So yeah, it was re really, uh, really eye opening and you know, really set the, set the way for what, what life was gonna be like on the Beast 10. Could you feel the power when you was taking off? Yeah, you could. Um, not when we were tanking, because when we were tanking, you know, the, the aircraft was always full to the gunnels and you know, you're always heavyweight. And a lot of the times when we were doing our refueling, it was in hot, um, hot countries. So you know, the aircraft was really limited on performance. So, um, and we were trying to get every little bit out of it. So there, it was a bit of a slow slog. Um, some of the times when it was light though, um, so maybe you were getting airborne empty to go and pick up some people or you were taking it somewhere for servicing or something like that, then yeah, absolutely. You know, there's, uh, I think each Conway was £20,000 or £22,000 of thrust, so you know, you've got over £80,000 of thrust coming out the back and if you've got a light aircraft then yeah, it's going to go. So mm -hmm. yeah, it, you, you, at times you could definitely feel the power. Chris, can you talk us through the flight deck of the VC-10? Yeah, of course. So the flight deck it was really quite spacious on the VC-10, even though it's quite a slim uh, you know, aircraft, a fuselage. Um, so you had four people on it, so for, for the RAF anyway. So we had a navigator who was sat on sort of the rear left, 
uh, flight engineer who was on the right and then the two pilots at the front and it was a little bit of a squeeze to sort of get past people's chairs but you know once you once you're in the, the flying positions in the pilot's positions really comfy chair loads of uh, leg room um you know and, and a really good view as well lots and lots of windows on the on the vc10 so um yeah and, and a, a really good feel in terms of crew uh, crew uh, you know crm but just that crew environment um there was good banter between everyone and uh, yeah particularly on some of the long tanking missions where you might not you might have big periods of time between um, aircraft arriving to be refueled. And mm -hmm. so if you just had two people, then you better get on because you just got to have, you know, that's the conversation you're having. But with four of us, at least, you know, there was always a good, good bit of joking around. And mm -hmm. I think we used to play Chival Pursuit sometimes as well to, to, you know, to try <laughs> and, and safer, yeah. pass the time, yeah. <laughs> did you have an oven though? I did have what, sorry? Have an oven. Uh, we did, yeah. So <laughs> the V10 actually, again, because it was an old airliner, had proper um, ovens that you would expect on maybe the, the commercial aircraft at the time, whereas most military aircraft have microwaves. So some of the food that the, uh, the, the, the rear crew could knock up was pretty, pretty good, actually. And obviously being a trucky pilot, you know, the food is important. So. Of course, yes. So can you tell us some of the strengths and weaknesses of the VC-10? Yeah, I mean, so strength-wise, actually, the Air Force um, I think really learned to use it and, and have quite vers quite a versatile role for it. So yeah, obviously it did its air transport, it did its air to air refueling. It had some other niche roles as well that it used to do. Um, you know, and they were really banking the fact that it had decent performance. You know, uh, even f even for you know when we were operating it. You know, I was on the VC10 from 2007 to 2010. So you know, it, was, it had been serving a long time, um, but it still had pretty good performance. Um, you know, so you could operate it you know, hot and high or what we did most often was very heavy with a lot of fuel in very hot conditions um, you know, for the Middle East um, and tank that way. Um, and obviously with the two wingtip pods at, f at good distance on the wings and also then a centre line if you were using one of the dedicated tankers then you were really, you know, as a tanking platform you were really versatile as well. So yeah, that was definitely the strengths of it I think was its versatility and the way that the Air Force learned to use it. Um, I suppose weaknesses, yeah, it was just, it's an old aircraft. So, uh, and also airliners, even from the 50s and 60s, but definitely modern day, are expected to fly all the time. They're designed to be airborne. They're not happy sat on the ground. And of course, <laughs> the way the Air Force used the VC-10 was it wasn't always flying, so it did sit on the ground sometimes. And and, and you know, an aging platform as well, then it, it did suffer serviceability. That being said, you know, I, I previously said it was almost over-engineered, so mm -hmm. it did have a lot of resilience. Um, so you, know, you could fly with quite a few you know, minor issues. Um, um, you know, so it did take quite a lot to actually ground the VC-10, you know, because yeah. of that resilience. So what was it like getting posted to your frontline squadron? Yeah, so really exciting. So it doesn't really matter what aircraft type you're flying uh, or, and what you aspire to fly. Getting yeah. onto your frontline squadron and a, a frontline role is, is, is what you've been aiming for and is really exciting. So again, 101 squadron was the squadron I went to. So, you know, investing in the history of it and finding out I used to fly Lancasters in the war and, you know, it had a really, really, um, you know, uh, prestigious history. So that was great to be part of that and feel like you're carrying that on. Also, there's, there's a, a mantra that's sort of set on junior pilots when you arrive in the squadron and you're expected to have a good time and be worked hard because, in theory, if you've got there at a young age, and I was 24 when I um, got onto the, uh, onto the VC-10, you shouldn't have too many other real-life commitments, so you should be able to throw yourself into your work and, and enjoy being on the squadron. And uh, yeah, you've got that cadre as well, of a squadron of 26 crews, great cadre of, and obviously, you know, you know, two pilots on the flight deck, engineers, navs, really big air crew contingent, so great social, uh, great atmosphere and ethos to be part of. Uh, mm -hmm. I remember like dining in nights and things on the squadron were, were fantastic. So some of my fondest memories, absolutely. And I'm sure most people on their, on their first frontline squadrons have the same. It's, you know, it's, you've achieved what you set out to do. So it's yeah, really, really great fun. Maybe you can uh, tell us, obviously, there's, is there a pilot and co-pilot? Is that mm. what you describe as? Could you tell us what their, the roles were? Were they the same or? Yeah, so I, I think certain multi-engines and even maybe even airlines do things slightly differently. But uh, so we had the, uh, a captain and a co-pilot which was almost uh, administrative. So we would, you know, the captain was obviously responsible for everything that happened on the aircraft and, and really you know, the buck stopped with them. And the co-pilot was obviously there to support in that sort of operation role. But then in terms of flying, we would just declare who was going to be the op and non-op. So the operating pilot and non-op. And that, that would just, you know, you would just decide that as a crew. So operating pilot was the person doing all the flying and the non-op would be doing the radios and things like that. So, uh, I mean, and it wasn't hard and fast. You could swap that and whatnot. You, can, you might say, well, you operate for the takeoff and I'll operate for the landing. Mm -hmm. But more often than not, it was, you're operating this leg, you're non-op. So yeah, co and captain was very much sort of, you know, the labels put on people for an administrative sort of viewpoint and then operating and non-operating was how we actually flew the aircraft. 
So obviously the main role, as you said, 80% was refueling mm. on your time. So let's talk about the refueling. Was it a difficult process? And could you just talk us through that, how it all works? Because it must be quite difficult. Yeah, I mean, it's not that difficult for the pilots of the tanker, to be perfectly honest. I should say that right, outright right. because there'll be fast jet people um, saying you know, that it is difficult for the people who are taking the fuel. And actually, <laughs> I, c I can only imagine how hard it is um, out there on there trying to, to line up with a, a wingtip pod, particularly like something like the tornado where the pod moves at the last moment because of the, you know, the air being pushed by the tornado nose cone. Um, but for us, you know, actually, it was all about getting in position, making sure you uh, got there as efficiently as you could and working out how much fuel you had to give because it was our fuel. So there wasn't a separate tank. You, you could run yourself dry. So you always had to be very careful. You always wanted to give as much fuel as you could, particularly on operations, and you wanted to leave. The best case scenario was you left on absolute minimums, having given all the fuel you could give. But it was very much so. Most of the time, what we were doing was, as a crew, keeping on top of our calculations to make sure that we had the fuel, how much spare did we have if anyone needed it and how much could we give. So, but then it was mainly about being in the right part of the sky where the, the receivers were expecting you to be. And then even the actual tanking itself, the giving of fuel, the dispensing of fuel was mainly handled by the air engineer. So they, they, they were the ones you know, deploying the hoses, transferring the fuel, um, and, uh, and, and you know, our job was just to keep flying the, flying the pattern. Um, what we did do while we were tanking was we actually used the autopilot in a manual mode, so that it was quite an old autopilot, it was quite clunky, but effectively you had a turn dial to roll the aircraft, and you had some trim wheels to sort of pitch it, although you would put it in uh, altitude lock, and then you would just turn it manually. Um, but what you would do is be holding with one, one hand on the control column, because occasionally the autopilot would get out of sync it would get out of balance and then it would cut, it would kick out. And so you, you, know, you had to be bracing for it to kick out. You could almost feel it happening as well. You could feel the, the controls getting heavier as you were maybe in a turn and you could see the height starting to drop off and you knew the autopilot was probably going to kick out. Um, and you always felt like apologizing over the radio because you know, you, you know, there'd be a bit of a kick and obviously you'd have to then try and trim it out and put the autopilot back in. So um, you know, I, I think it might have been smoother for the pilot to fly the whole time, but actually the VC-10 was quite a heavy aircraft to fly manually because um, okay. it's power assisted yeah. controls, but it's still quite rudimentary. So um, although it was enjoyable, I think if you were doing it for sort of an hour flying a racetrack, you might get quite tired. So hence we use the autopilot. So was the VC-10 just probe and drug? Yes, it was, yeah. So, um, yeah, all, all three of our units um, were at hose and drum, so, um, oh, sorry, at hose and drum in the middle, so the hoodoo, which was the center line, which was on the dedicated tankers, so the K variants. So that could uh, refuel the larger aircraft, so it was a longer hose. Aircraft would come up from um, in, on the center line, and then it also dispensed at a higher rate. I think it was roughly two tonnes a minute, whereas the wingtip uh, pods, they were a, a, a tonne a minute, and obviously designed for the, the, the fighters and the, uh, and, the, and the jet aircraft that would come up. Um, but yeah, so they all, so we would, um, we obviously, I, I think one of your questions is about who we refueled. So obviously British aircraft, but also um, quite often American aircraft, if we were doing um, refueling for um, Optelic or Herrick, you know, Afghanistan or Iraq. Um, but even there, the Americans are split how they refuel. So the American Air Force refuels with um, a boom that the Navy refuels with Hose and Drake. So we would end up refueling a lot of naval um, American aircraft. So did you have a favorite aircraft to refuel? Yeah, I mean, there's a few that I liked seeing, and uh, partly the variety as well, if you saw something a bit different. So um, I was just lucky enough to see the very final days of the uh, Tomcat. So, Lucky bugger. <laughs> yeah, so something as large as that coming up, and, and obviously iconic for me being an 80s baby, was, was pretty cool. Um, but they quickly disappeared. Um, and then the, the Prowler was always quite an amusing one, really, because I always found it quite weird that when it would be alongside, you could see four people in, you know, it's a small jet, but there's four people sat in the flight deck or, or like flight deck cockpit, probably a cockpit, all on ejection seats. And it just like a, almost like a family outing. I always thought, you know, with two kids in the back. So, um, and probably quite a squeeze, but that, that was always quite an amusing one to see. And then obviously just, you know, actually as, as pilots, of course, we enjoyed getting fuel. So as the VC-10 obviously had a probe on the front, so we could take fuel. Um, and uh, that was great fun, uh, and, you know, and obviously flying, um, two large aircraft in close formation and when you're actually connected it's really really close i think there's a picture that you've posted that yeah you can see how close you are to yeah. the, the other vc10 or, or a tristar you, know, you can take fuel off tristar as well um so we used to love it as air crew the engineers used to hate it because the you know obviously the aircraft is not designed to fly behind another vc10 and take fuel so the t-tail sits directly in the you know the jet efflux of the the, the um the uh, um, dispensing aircraft so there's a mild vibration the whole way through your tanking and you might be there for about 20 minutes if you're taking a decent amount of fuel um but Was of course a bit nervy on your first time <laughs> yeah i mean usually the captains did it to be right. to say you had to be qualified to tank but um 
often of aircraft. But yeah, it was. Uh, it, I, I remember they said you wouldn't like it so much if you went down the back and you through the periscope at how much the T tails wobbling around in it. You know, but um, and they used to have to do checks when we got back. But from a purely flying point of view, it was it was great to you know, obviously be so close to another aircraft of that size and, and take fuel. Did you see any um, unusual like formations, like two aircraft that wouldn't normally be flying together waiting for fuel? Yeah, I mean, so on your wing, you might end up with a, a real mix of coalition uh, aircraft. So yeah, you, obviously um, Tornado GFORs being the mainstay of the, uh, the RAF for Herrick and Telic. Um, but so you would have those, but equally yeah, you'd have maybe the uh, US Navy's F-18s, Prowlers. Um, so yeah, you would, you would, they, they were probably the three main ones that you would get, you know, F-18s, Prowlers and, and, and Tornadoes. Um, but of course, if you were doing maybe the Falklands, you'd get the uh, Typhoon. And if you were doing UK type, um, for exercises in the UK or training, you, you could get a real mix because again, you know, um, you know they're, they're just, if we're doing an exercise and it's a multinational exercise, you might get a, a mix of aircraft. Although of course, it's a bit more standardized now. So a lot of people have typhoons. You know, so we used to get Italian typhoons and German typhoons and you know, so, um, but yeah, so yeah, quite a mix. Tanking the larger stuff was rarer. So I remember being down in the Falklands once and having to go and get a, um, a uh, E3D that was coming down. Oh wow! So we met that, you know, as it left Ascension, we met that about halfway and gave it its fuel that it needed to carry on direct to um, to the Falcons. So, you know, less usual to see something like that. Um, you know, and um, but occasionally, and Herx, obviously, we used to refuel a lot in the uh, in the uh, in the Falcons. The Hercules would do a lot of refueling to get their practice in. So. Did you ever chat with the Americans, you know, the 135 guys mm. and the KC-10s? Did you ever swap information or anything like that? Yeah, I mean, quite different different roles in the way like they what the uh, all of the american tankers are boom uh, but what they had what they did was put um pods on the end so you might get a mix they they did operate boom and hose and drogue um so but yeah very different procedures but yeah particularly like when we were based in ali deed supporting um Telic and herrick then um you know in the evenings in the communal bar because you're allowed Three beers a day in LED, so you might go and have a beer after a flight. Um, you could you could chat in, uh, there, and you might have heard them on frequency or whatever. So you might go and have a chat with them. Um, and equally, we also had an exchange officer on the VC10. So we had two actually. We had an Italian exchange officer and a um, an American exchange officer. Oh, so wow. um, so I I was on the 10 for three and a bit years. So I saw two just by timelines, two two Americans come through and two Italians. So yeah, again, you're there. They are part of your squadron at that point. They're fully embedded. You know, they fly with you as as per they, they were brick. British crew, so yeah, you, yeah, you really learn a lot from them, and they will have come from the equivalent tankers that that nation flies. So, and did you have much banter with the TriStar guys? <laughs> yeah, quite a lot of banter with the TriStar guys. My housemate actually, when I used to live in Cheltenham as a as a junior pilot, was a was a TriStar co-pilot, so um, we used to have quite a lot of stick. In truth, the TriStar did an awful lot of air transport and occasional tanking, um, but yeah, we did we did have quite a lot of banter because yeah, obviously each fleet felt they did it better than the other fleet. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm just go off a bit here because um, I've seen uh, on YouTube and stuff sometimes when they refuel, you sometimes the fighter jets kick in the afterburners or drop flares. Did you ever see anything like that? Yeah, so sometimes they might um, sort of use the burners to accelerate away from you or drop some flares. It depends, like if they more so the Americans than the Brits, like maybe a little bit more. Uh, liberal in what they're allowed to do but um yeah i mean although you would usually see a burner on a, a tornado gr4 because if we were quite high the tornado would struggle um and um as they got heavier they'd struggle more and more and so you would get into this really silly situation where they would pretty much fly with one burner in to stay in contact so i think that they were burning crudely 600 pounds or oh, 600 pounds a minute or kilograms a minute sorry and we were giving a ton so you know they were burning it to stay in to top up that tiny bit so that was always quite amusing just to see them hanging on in there because you know again they're, they're a ground attack aircraft so they did struggle at height to uh, to try and try and refuel them whereas when the typhoon came in um, and we were refueling them far more often obviously they they don't have an issue so they we can go I think that was one of the first times I refueled at the top height of a VC-10. So refueling for us, I think, was 36,000, was the max height we could refuel that oh, okay. or dispense fuel yeah. that. And so a tornado would never get up there, but the, um, the Typhoon obviously could. So I do remember. And there were, you know, there were differences in handling up there. So, um, yeah, it was interesting to see. So you briefly mentioned there that you flew on live operations. Could you tell us about this? Yeah, so I mean, um, like I said, 80% of my hours are, are, are probably um, air to air refueling. And of that, probably 75% are operational um, only about five percent are in the uk to just keep currencies up and things like that so um in my time it was um telic which was iraq and um afghanistan so herrick um, i left before sort of syria and libya and but of course the, the vc10 stayed operational all the way to the end in 2013 so you know friends of mine that stayed so i left as, at the end of my co-pilot tour to instruct but friends that stayed as captains they they also tanked for libya they tanked for syria so you know um shows how important air to air fueling is in modern 
um, combat operations. But from my experience, yeah, Herrick uh, and Telic, um, both of those we were based most of the time out of Ali Deed in Qatar. So yeah, obviously with a safe destination to fly back to and depart from and then go to the overhead, the conflict zone and then and come back. So the only downside of that is you're obviously burning fuel to, mm-hmm. to, you know, and from you know, from Qatar to Afghanistan, you're burning quite a lot of fuel to get there. So, and the V10 was not economical, so by any standard. So, yeah, that was a bit frustrating, but that's the way it was because you couldn't fly 10 in or out of those sort of countries um, in the conflicts that we had. So, um, yeah, I think I did Muscat a bit as well, so Seab um, out of uh, Oman as well early on for Herrick as well, but nearly always that sort of Gulf, Gulf state territory. So, you must, well, you probably do, but any memorable missions from flying on live operations? Memorable missions, yeah. I mean, weirdly, the the tanking ones, because there's so many of them, sort of merge a little bit. Um, Always a sense of satisfaction at the time, like I said, if you could leave on minimums, maybe having to have done some calculations in the air, you know, there's been a shout out for have you got spare fuel, and and, and that was always really satisfying, to really, really crunch the figures so that you, you departed or, or, you know, on vapors effectively and, or you were landing on vapors because obviously you had to fly back but so that was that was really good to do um but i think the versatility versatility of the v10 meant that my more memorable missions are those ones that happened less often so um in the falcons we would we were there on standby um, as, a, as the tanker support for the f3s and then the typhoons but actually we also there was uh, potentially could be used as an aeromed so i remember being woken up once at sort of two in the morning um, to, to fly someone that had injured themselves on a live firing exercise to Montevideo mm. um, in Uruguay. And um, weirdly, I think we were actually expecting a stand down day the next day. They were going to do some work on the aircraft. So we'd even gone to bed quite late, not expecting to fly. So it's always that sort of, you know, if it can happen, it will. Um, um, so, yeah, so we flew to, uh, to Montevideo and, and got this guy you know, on, onward for his onward travel um, back to the UK or wherever, whichever hospital he was going to. But that was memorable, I remember, because we got stuck on the ground there. Um, you know, the time-wise, we ended up staying overnight. And then when we went to leave in the morning, uh, we noticed that there were actually uh, birds nesting in the, uh, or there were birds going into the sort of fuel drain holes up on the tea tail. And I remember as I got off the bus, sort of pointing it out to the captain and saying, oh yeah, there's a bird just gone in there. And then dawning on me what that meant. And of course, yeah, we watched them do it and they were doing it over and over again. So we then had to try and get some sort of high rise platform that we could do a, visual inspection of what had happened. And of course this airport just didn't have anything that was suitable for getting up to the height of a VC-10 tail. So I'm pretty sure the handling agent just went out to the, the road and just flagged down. And it was comical. I mean, I think we had about three different types of vehicle arrive and each time the engineers would say, yeah, yeah not, no, no chance, I'm not going up in that. <laughs> um, eventually we did find something that was tall enough and um, yeah, they'd been nesting in there all overnight. And so they had to take a panel off and there was literally a bird's nest wow. um, up in the you know, insides of the tail. So um, that was memorable. So. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, interesting ones like that. But uh, most of the tanking ones, although the majority, um, they did merge a little bit because mm-hmm. they're very similar in what you were doing. But. So how many missions did you actually fly? Um, I didn't actually keep a solid count. I, I mean, I could. I could go back in my logbook. They're all listed there. Um, I know if, to get trigger for the medal for for, uh, for Opterlik and Opteric, uh, it was usually 31 missions, which actually you do it was probably two detachments you'd have to do to get that we only did four week detachments at a time so although you know some some crews or some aircraft would go out for far longer like a tornado might go out for four months as a squadron but we used to go as crews and probably do four weeks at a time Mm -hmm. and but we maybe do four or five a year so um after about your second you would have enough missions to um have tick you know tick the box for the medal but yeah i mean it's actually it's easier to think of it percentages of my hours rather than um, how many actual missions I did. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned there before, oh, at the start of the, the chat, um, 20% was transport. So what would it just be troops or would it be cargo as well? Yeah, really, really varied actually. So that 20% was, we were quite lucky because um, the V10 didn't have any defensive aids. Um, so we weren't going, we weren't doing air transport into Afghanistan or Iraq. So the TriStar took the, bro- you know, the brunt of that. So um, much the, you know, um, disappointment of my, my my housemate but you know they mainly did the middle east which left us available to do you know um africa and america and for, for mainly for exercises yeah. so yeah really varied so you know um you know we used to go to nairobi a few times belize um you know canada and sort of calgary and places like that um also some in the winter we had all the data for contaminated ops so landing on snow and uh, and um, you know standing packed ice and things like that so we would also do the the flights into norway as well so um so of that 20 percent massive variety of destinations 
quite few and far between unfortunately but you know when you did go to them and each of those had their own little nuances so flying across the Atlantic to America had its own procedural nuances Africa was very different again going into um, um, into Nairobi Norway really interesting approaches in there because of all the high ground so yeah it was really you know flying over the the, the, the you know the Canadian outback I guess you know was really cool um, I remember seeing the northern lights on one sorty back where we were really high up and you know they were just all around us you know and you could just look out and see them so there's moments like that which came from that small amount of air transport flying so yeah it, few and far between but really really varied which mm. was really enjoyable. So was the VC-10 force a good one to be part of and did you enjoy your time on it? Yeah, I, I thought so. I mean, what, you, know, you can only know your fleet, can't you? But um, yeah, I, I definitely wasn't disappointed. Clearly, when I didn't make it as a fast jet pilot, having set my stall out to want to be a fast jet pilot, mm -hmm. I you know, was disappointed, mainly myself, because I think it was a fair cop that I was probably not cut out to be a fast jet pilot. But, um, but having arrived on the VC-10 and then looking back on it now, I don't know if I'd say I wouldn't change it, but it was fantastic. Uh, I have really fond memories. Uh, the flying I got to do, although a lot of multi-engine flying is not particularly exciting, the variety, the destinations, and even actually some of the flying, because the VC-10 was you know, a legacy aircraft, you do fly it. Um, unlike modern airliners, you, you do actually f fly it a lot. So, um, you know, it was, yeah, I really enjoyed it. First Squadron, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't think I'd change it. And how many hours did you get in total? I got a thousand and ten, so um, so <laughs> you got your thousand pound, uh, yeah, pound just uh, yeah, you know, hours are harder to come by nowadays. So I think you know some of my older and bolder instructors and captains were probably closer to two or three, but you know hours it's just the way of the world, and hours are getting fewer and farther between. So yeah, I just just ticked over the thousand before I before I left. Mm -hmm.